toying with the trepidation, fear, anxiety, and dread of the consumer, slasher movies, creature features, and the horror genre as a whole has repeatedly seen growth in a nihilistic age begging to find any sort of meaning to life. Scientists, psychologists, and researchers have searched for the reason as to why, for example, in 2020, horror films were more popular than ever, as many in the world were locked down inside of their houses, unable to go to their favorite cinema to watch these tales of gruesome display. While the culture has continually grown more dependent upon medicinal avenues to quell these inner demons, the unrelenting need for cinema that mimics these very attributes has also continued to be cultivated. For those who suffer from anxiety, the visual bias to attend to their threat is exaggerated. This is part of the reason why horror works for anxious people. Someone who is feeling anxious will be more easily sucked into the plot of a horror film, constantly surveilling the scene for the threat. This increased vigilance due to the suspense may in turn increase their immersion in the story. The belief is that these horror films allow the anxious audience member to believe they have a sense of control, and several studies show that increasing perceived control, even if imaginary, reduces activation of brain regions that respond to threat and decreases anxiety. This pseudo-control places the person into the movie as it renders the imagination with a sense of involvement and places the person into the story. A frightening thought when considering how gruesome some of these films can be. Truth be told, this has been the modus operandi of such fans as the popularity of these works during the medieval and Victorian age had audiences entertained by the very fears and frightening commentary on the lives they had been living. During the Renaissance, the work of the alchemists and magicians mirrored the superstitious heritage that was seen in popular novels of their time, some of which whose aim was to warn of the dangers of playing with everlasting fire. In the 16th century, a German play by the name of Dr. Faustus became legendary folklore as the tale has many different versions of the story, but the core framework remains the same. Faust was a brilliant and successful scholar, but he had to have more and did not want to be limited to simply human knowledge. So he summoned the devil in order to ask him for supreme knowledge and power so he could truly enjoy all that this world has to offer. Satan sends him a messenger demon, Mephistopheles, who offers Faust a deal. He can have supreme knowledge and power for 24 years, but in return, Faust must surrender his soul for an eternity in hell. Faust accepts and seals the deal in blood. Faust lives the next 24 years in luxury, seduces women, travels the world, summoning spirits as his knowledge continues to grow. He lives his hedonistic lifestyle for the duration of the 24 years promised as he grows in knowledge and power. While some versions of the story have him outsmarting the devil through a plan he conceived with his wit accrued in the 24 years of decadence, the typical ending is Faustus waiting for the devil as his time is up and he is carried away to hell. As Dr. Faust remains a turn of phrase for the Faustian pact of dealing one's soul to the devil, many of those who practice the dark art of Satanism deny his very existence. In fact, TV, books, and movies have long since jettisoned the thought of warning of Satan's influence and have either minimized said role or even made Satan out to be misunderstood, deep down a solid guy, or even a hero. Look no further than Fox's production of the show Lucifer that casts the devil as a handsome, witty figure with magical powers, or the more recent cartoon Little Demon that depicts the Antichrist as a teenage girl whose mother is a practicing witch and her father the devil. The wave of making Satan more likable has hit the fast track. Shows like The Simpsons and South Park have made light of it. While these shows seemingly make him a friend, even comedian Adam Sandler played a half-spawn of Satan in his movie Little Nicky, where the devil 
fell in love with an angel played by Reese Witherspoon who happened to drink too much one night and ended up falling into the arms of the devil and having a deformed child in Nikki. The list can go on, but Satan has continually gotten a makeover as to make him more palatable for audiences and the like to accept. Many of the practicing Satanists today doubt the existence of God or a literal devil, but still perform magic as a means to manipulate the matter around them and bend it into their will. As 32-year-old Satanist Misty Tyre stated regarding lesser magic, it's all about charming people or presenting yourself in such a way that you win people over. You manipulate the world around you to get what you need. People often think of manipulation negatively, but anytime you handle something or do something to achieve something specific, that's manipulation. Greater magic, meanwhile, is about allowing yourself a time and a place to process events, both physical and emotional, or to focus your energy for a specific purpose. This often takes the form of a ritual. Back in the 1960s and 70s, images of LeVay surrounded by naked women during these rituals were common, as were nude altars. Misty also stated, I credit Satanism for a lot of the successes in my life. She was converted at the age of 27 after discovering a book called The Satanic Witch by the founder of the Church of Satan, Anton Xander LeVay. LeVay convinced many that joining the Church of Satan was merely a symbol of rebellion and not an actual religion that believed in a literal Satan. The only problem with that is that they've been lied to. What they simply see as rebellion or the advancement of their will and the acceptance of self was really a delusion painted by not only Satan, but even LeVay himself. In an article by Joe Schimmel titled, The Truth About Satanic Cults, he details his experience with one of the Manson murderers, Susan Atkins, and her knowledge of what Anton truly believed. One of the delusions that we will clear up at the outset of this article is the lie that leading satanic cults do not believe in or truly worship the devil. First of all, it should be understood that Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, viewed Satan as a true entity that he actually worshiped before his death. Anton LaVey deceived a lot of people who joined the Church of Satan by claiming that Satan only represented the repressed forces of nature, but was not a real entity. In my interviews with former Charles Manson family member, Susan Atkins, who was still in prison at the time after being convicted of eight murders, she blew the lid off of Anton's lie. As a former associate of Anton LaVey's, who danced for him and spent personal time with him before joining the Manson family, Atkins was privy to conversations with LeVay before he became popular. Atkins told me repeatedly that while LeVay promotes a watered-down, palatable form of Satanism to the ignorant masses which he is deceiving, he acknowledged the exact opposite to her and to his inner core of Satanists in the Church of Satan. Susan Atkins shared with me that LeVay had told her emphatically while she was in his home that they truly worship Satan as a real entity and as the one who began the initial rebellion against God. Atkins also stated, quote, Anton told me that as a Satanist, he does believe in the God of the Bible, but he refused to worship him and made a conscious decision to worship Satan instead. And Anton himself let his hair down regarding his true beliefs as well. LeVay let his guard down when responding to other Satanists that considered him not extreme enough. LeVay, while in a defensive mode, admitted that the image that he presented publicly was deceptive, declaring, quote, if they're at all intelligent, other true Satanists, they'll realize that there's only so much I can say publicly. I will not advance things in print which make my position untenable. How long? Would the Church of Satan have lasted if I hadn't appeased an outrage in just the right combination? It required a certain amount of discretion and diplomacy to balance the outrage. While the downplay of Satan continues in our modern culture, the truth remains that he is a murderer from the beginning and he is the father of lies. Anyone who is following him, in jest or not, 
given over to his power, knowingly or not. While some, like Dave Grohl for example, have embellished stories of being haunted in order to sell tickets, others have made it clear that the hauntings they experienced weren't simply a means to line their pocket, but actual events that stuck with them. The demonic realm isn't something to be played with, and plenty of actors have lost sleep, their minds, and some even their lives to demons they encountered when going out for different roles. In the most recent rendition of Stephen King's It, the actor who played Pennywise the Clown, Bill Skarsgård, detailed the haunting dreams that he encountered while playing the role of the child-killing clown. I really enjoyed the, the process of making this film, but it's so intense, so like, you know, and then, you know, you rap and you're done, and then a day later I'm in Stockholm. Like a day later I'm in Stockholm. And like, I'm like, what just ha what just happened? You know, what, like, and, and you don't, like, you just finished this film. I have to kill some children. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I did have ten, like, probably ten full days of just kind of this exorcism of, like, nightmares of, of, of Pennywise. Every, like, pretty much every night uh, there was nightmares. And it wasn't... I mean, obviously it wasn't, like, the Pennywise versus me, it was, you know, me being Pennywise, people looking at me, and I'm like, they are not allowed to see me right here, it was this kind of paranoia, very kind of weird dreams. The late Carrie Fisher, who is best known for her role as Princess Leia in the Star Wars saga, speaks of the demonic activity she encountered after her friend died in her bed right beside her. There was this really strong sense of a presence in the house. One night, um, I was in my room, the room that uh, Greg had died in, and I was, it was very, very late at night, and I was writing, and I, I had this, um, gag toy. I had used it many years before when I was doing a, a, writing one of the young indies with George Lucas and we both had them and you'd push the button on it and it would, it would just say awful things to you. You're Eat shit. Are you talking to me? And I'd left it in the room next to mine, my closet, where Greg had left many of his clothes. And through the wall, I heard... I said, Greg, stop it. That is not funny. Out of all the little things that it could have said, the one thing that the machine, the little toy had said was, Basically, are you communicating with me? He did not accept leaving, and that part of him, yes, was in the house, and even part of him was trying to sort of enter me, in a way. And some of the most famous horror films in the modern era, such as The Exorcist and Poltergeist, have brought chills down the spine of those who worked behind the scenes on the film, and some of the mysterious ends of those who lost their lives shortly after working on the films. The term was even coined regarding one movie as, quote, the poltergeist curse, as it has been attempted to explain some of the harrowing and mysterious stories and even deaths of those who worked on the project. Four cast members died during and soon after the filming of the series. Carol Ann Freeling, the young focal point of the series, was played by Heather O'Rourke only six years old when the first Poltergeist film was released. O'Rourke captivated audiences with her stark blonde hair, doll-like appearance, and big, inquisitive eyes. Sadly, however, she was misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease in 1987. The following year, O'Rourke fell ill again, and her symptoms were casually attributed to the flu. A day later, she collapsed and suffered a cardiac arrest. After being airlifted to a children's hospital in San Diego, O'Rourke died during an operation to correct a bowel obstruction, and it was later believed that she had been suffering from a congenital intestinal abnormality. 
Dominique Dunn, who played the original older sister, Dana Freeling, met an equally tragic and unforeseen fate. In 1982, Dunn separated from her partner, John Sweeney. In November of that year, he showed up at Dunn's house, pleading for her to take him back. When she refused, Sweeney grabbed Dunn's neck, choked her until she was unconscious, and he left her to die in her Hollywood home's driveway. Sweeney was sentenced to six and a half years in prison, but was released after three years and seven months. The other two cast member deaths, while unfortunate, were not as unpredictable or mysterious. The evil preacher Kane from Poltergeist 2 was played by Julian Beck. In 1983, Beck had been diagnosed with stomach cancer, which took his life soon after he finished work on the second installment of the series. The same film was met with further tragedy after Will Sampson, who played Taylor the Native American shaman, died after undergoing a heart-lung transplant, which had a very slim survival rate. Cast deaths were not the only agents of the curse's proliferation, as other peculiar and creepy legends surround the film franchise. Jo Beth Williams, who played mom Diane Freeling in the first two films, claimed that director Spielberg insisted on using actual human skeletons as props in an attempt to save money. At the time, they were cheaper than plastic skeletons. Williams' claim has never been verified, but it persists to this day in the lore surrounding the film's curse. Finally, in an effort to further creep out everyone involved, Samson, the real-life medicine man, performed an authentic exorcism after shooting wrapped up one night. Actors such as Ryan Reynolds and James Brolin have commented on the supernatural events or darkness surrounding their roles in the Amityville horror movies, which depict what took place in November of 1974 when Ronald DeFeo Jr. shot and killed six members of his family at 112 Ocean Avenue in their large Dutch colonial house situated in a suburban neighborhood in Amityville on the South Shore of Long Island, New York. And even for actors who remain skeptic, such as actor Patrick Wilson, could not explain all of the events that took place while filming The Conjuring. Quote, it was a huge curtain that went from the floor to the ceiling, which was sort of waving violently, and there was no door open or fan on, no nothing. That was a very, very odd occurrence because nothing else was moving around it and nothing was blowing. You didn't even hear any air but you watch these curtains sort of violently going. Wilson considers himself a skeptic and all, but all his supernatural screenplay may have gotten the better of him at this point because he's admitted to believing his own house may be haunted now. I've heard people on two different occasions say they've heard kids laughter in the middle of the night in my house. And his co-star, Joy King, was even forced to seek help from medical doctors when she was waking up with bruises on her body with no reason for them to be there. How do you explain that all of a sudden during the filming of the movie, mysterious bruises show up on you? All right, okay, let me ju let me, let's jump into this story because this story, it is so, it's so weird. And this is truly like the root of why I'm so scared of that movie. Um, so, you know, in the story, when the mom gets possessed, she gets all these bruises on her. And so during the filming of those particular scenes, I started having a lot of bruises show up on my body in bizarre places, like on my stomach, on my chest, like what? And so the makeup ladies thought I was stealing their fake bruises and like playing a joke on them. And I was like, uh, why would I do that? I'm not doing that. That's crazy. They didn't believe me. They tried to take my real bruises off with like rubbing alcohol and oil. And I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm not lying. I went to the doctor. I got a couple blood tests because they told me it looked like it could potentially be early signs of leukemia. I was oh. so freaked out. All of a sudden, I'm told that I have this blood thinning condition called ITP, where basically most of my red platelets drained from my body mysteriously. I'd never had a blood problem in the past. I've never had a blood problem since then. I, 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 no one in my family has that. So um, I, I was at risk of needing a blood transfusion and they were like scared to even let me work. And because if I like touched something, I could get a bruise there. It was weird. 
And so I had to go to the hospital every day, twice a day, before and after work to get my blood taken, to check my platelets, and to try and rebuild my platelets on my own by taking a lot of iron. And they were just creeping up for the duration of the shoot. Uh, Shooting finishes, I go home, and I still have to keep up with this And then when I came home, my platelets were completely fine. Like I was back up to the normal numbers, and I've never since had a trace of that disorder. So no wonder you're freaked out by... Are you like, are you kidding me? Uh, like I, I thought I was, I was just like, you know what? This is it for me. Like I've had a good run. I'm 12 years old. I'm just going to, you know, get killed by a ghost now. I don't know. We'll see what happens. That is such a weird story. And no one has an explanation for it. I feel so freaked out by it. It's like so scary. Some have had these experiences only further their need to chase after these spirits and have been led down the trail of new age spirit science and demon worship. The artist turned actress, Lady Gaga, mentioned her haunted experiences and the advice she received from guru Deepak Chopra as to how to embrace the devil to help her be more creative. I had this dream quite recently that was so terrifying, so morbid and terrifying, and I called, um, I called Deepak Chopra, who I work with, and I was telling him my dream terrified that the devil and I I, the dream was so terrifying I thought somehow a a devil force was trying to take hold of me a darkness Mm. I I guess I see devil and darkness as the same thing and he laughed and told me that I was very creative (laughs) and that's what it represents learn to embrace, embrace my insanity Demi Lovato, whose gender fluidity has been the talk of many circles, has also shown herself chasing ghosts or aliens and even singing to them in hopes of getting communication with them. Do you like to sing, Carmen? Oh. You should sing something for her, Demi. No. Why not? Maybe if you sing a song as an offering, we... We could come back in the room. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go on and try to tear me down. I will be rising from the ground like a skyscraper. There we go. <laughs> Standing ovation. Cool. This was not her first encounter with ghostly spirits, as she claims to have had encounters at a very young age. During a conversation with Jojo Wright, host of the Paranormalish podcast, the singer recalled just one of her encounters with the ghost that haunted the Lovato home. I opened my closet and I saw a little girl dressed in like pioneer clothing, just standing in my closet. And I slammed the door. I ran to my sister's room and I said, Dallas, like, I think there's a ghost in my room. Lovato's sister dismissed the story and told her to go to bed. The future pop star, who was eight at the time, didn't want to tell anyone else about the incident. She was afraid they would think she had gone crazy. High School Musical star Vanessa Hudgens recently talked about her new fascinations with ghosts in her sit-down with Kelly Clarkson. Um, Zoe, is it true that you have a new passion in life? Are you obsessed with ghosts? I hear you are. It's not really a new passion. Okay, we're just finding out. You're just kind of, like, finding out. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I've, I've accepted the fact that, like... I, I see things and I hear things. And Wait, do you rather than really? Things. You've had like experiences? Yeah, a lot of wow. them. A lot of them over the years. Like even as a child growing up, like I remember being like getting ready for school when I was eight years old and there was like, you know those ducks that like is like the duck thing that you pull, it's a toy? Yeah. Um, there was one of those on the dining room table and I started walking and it just started like going alongside me and I was like, interesting. I recently did my first like real paranormal investigation, like with equipment and everything. What when equipment? To... Like a flex capacitor? Like what are we talking about here? Like what what kind of equipment? <laughs> there's a lot. There's there's so much on the market, genuinely. What? But like my favorite thing is called a spirit box. Okay. And it basically scans radio frequencies really quickly. You okay. want to do it in like more of a rural place so it doesn't peak, pick up stations. Um, and like if you put on AM, it just sounds like static. But something about the electricity that it creates a allows spirits to speak through it. Oh. 
Um, and I, I mean, was, the Earth is all we do have frequencies. The exactly. Earth has its own frequency. Exactly. Okay. So I was sitting at a, a, a tombstone in a graveyard with my best friend. Because that's what we do. <laughs> that's what. <laughs> well, if you're trying to find ghosts, yeah. like you know go what? to the graveyard. <laughs> yeah. Um, and is this I at nighttime sitting, or? Yeah, nighttime, pitch black. <laughs> wow, we're different. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we found this one tombstone of a spirit that we were told is very playful. Oh. Um, so I turn it on. I'm like, hi, Sam. I'm Vanessa. This is Gigi. I'm like, I'm not very good at this. I'm like, you're Sam. <laughs> I am so <laughs> into then, doing this. And then, wow. And then Gigi goes, Sam, can you tell us our names? What are our names? And then we just hear, shh, Vanessa, shh. No. No. Yeah. Did you run then? No. <laughs> No, I was like, cool, do you have anything else that you want to tell me? And I just hear, shh, nope. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool, well, thank you. Uh, you have to like tell them to stay because you don't want spirits to follow you. Or do you? No, you don't. <laughs> no, no. But it isn't simply these young stars who talk about their fascination with spirits. Oprah Winfrey talks about her experience with a spirit that was pushed into her room by her co-star, in the movie, The Color Purple. I did this movie, Color Purple, with a woman named uh, Kuswa Busia. Kuswa Busia was the sister, you know, when they're playing. She was in my house, here in Chicago, sleeping in the guest bedroom, which is right next to, to, to my bedroom. And I woke up in the middle of the night. I saw a ghost in the room. I'm telling you, it was a ghost in the room. And I didn't want to believe it was a ghost in the room, because I never believed in ghosts or didn't believe in ghosts. But I saw this, this figure, clear figure, moving across the floor. I got up to see, is there light from another building? What is going on here? Oprah has been considered by many as America's Jezebel, as her talk show has exposed countless women to the New Age teachings of the likes of Eckhart Tolle and others. She herself has admitted to using spirits for her roles, the very spirits she thought were invading her room in the shooting of the film. The one-woman entertainment empire known as Oprah has strong affiliations with the demonic realm. The most familiar face on television says, You can not only use your body and physical self. This is how I see acting. I ask my body to be the carrier for the spirits of those who have come before me in a way that is most meaningful to the character. Just become the vehicle for that character. Calling out for these entities to take her over so that she may become a sparkling puppet, Oprah admits of her work before the camera. I tried to empty myself and let the spirit inhabit me. With her global influence, her shows have become a smorgasbord for the New Age agenda. While other stars, such as Jim Carrey in his role as Andy Kaufman, or Heath Ledger in his role as Joker, and a plethora of others, have left production of their films without being able to fully leave behind the characters they portrayed. It has always been that what lies underneath many of these roles is far more than a few lines on some paper. These films, horror or otherwise, ingratiate themselves into the culture and become a commentary on the events, issues, and milieu of our time. So what does it say that the macabre, devilish, and gruesome category is at an all-time high? It shows the culture is necessitating such a supply chain because the framework around us has become the very thing that makes our hair stand up at the thought of it. Some who have made their money, fame, and infamy have even come out and spoke out against the reality of the dangers of the love of the occult, evil, and macabre lifestyle. In an Instagram post by famed tattoo artist Kat Von D, she writes, I don't know if any of you have been going through changes in your lives right now, but in the last few years, I've come to some pretty meaningful realizations, many of them revolving around the fact that I got a lot of things wrong in my past. Today, I went through my entire library and threw out books that just don't align with who I am and who I want to be. I've always found beauty in the macabre, but at this point, I just had to ask myself, what is my relationship with this content? And the truth is, I just don't want to invite any of these things into our family's lives, even if it comes disguised in beautiful covers collecting dust on my shelves. In no way is this post designed to put anyone down if you're into this stuff, because I think we are all on our own journey, and I love everyone, regardless of where they might be at. But right now, it's never been more clear to me 
that there is a spiritual battle taking place, and I want to surround myself and my family with love and light. With that being said, I want to send extra love to everyone out there and hope through some of these trying times, you are making meaningful changes in your life too. Thanks for listening. Sir Christopher Lee, who starred in such films as Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, actually warned against those who would get into the dark practices of the occult. I have met people who claimed to be Satanists, who claimed to be involved with black magic, who claimed that they not only knew a lot about it, but as I said, I've certainly haven't been involved and I warn all of you, never, never, never. You will not only lose your mind, you lose your soul. While serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy have had their biopics popularized in modern times, they also warned about the dangers of pornography and in Dahmer's case, of living a life free from the reality of the existence of God. The Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, and the Son of Sam, David Berkowitz, spoke of the influence of Satan or Satanism and what they had on their killing sprees. As far as Satan is concerned, I, I believe uh, in a malevolent being. Uh, his description eludes me, but I, I have felt powers that are evil. A lot was made that you're a devil worshiper. Do you worship the devil? Have you ever studied Satanism? <sighs> there are different sects of Satanism. Have you studied, just yes or no, have you studied yes, Satanism? Yes, I have. Are you, are you a worshiper of the devil? No comment. Come on, Richard. We're I can tell you a little bit about Satanism. Well, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what you got to say then. It is undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. <sighs> it is power, power without charity. A Satanist admits to being evil. Do you admit to being evil, Richard? We are all evil in some form or another, are we not? Who was the son of Sam? Who was Sam and the son of Sam? I at one time had uh, gotten into Satan worship and uh, this entity, this, this demon, that was uh, his name and uh, I had uh, just allowed the devil, at one time it was the foolish and stupidest thing I ever did in my life, I just let the devil take control of me back in the 1975, 76, even before the crime started, uh, I made a pact with the devil. Did you hear voices in your mind? Is that how it came to you? Uh, after some uh, rituals and initiations and things that I went through, I, f I began to experience, now that I look back and see what they were, they were like hallucinations and, uh, you know, Satan had come upon me with his power and, and, uh, and uh, they were like audio-visual things that began to change and so forth. While Ramirez seemingly was unrepentant of his murder spree and believed that Satan was a figure aiding him in his killings, David Berkowitz had a change of heart and wanted people to know the saving gospel of Jesus Christ in the end. You have millions of people watching you at this moment, but let's bring it down. To the families of those that that man, that other man, killed, yeah. and to some of the people who even survived then who yeah. were wounded. What do you say to them, David? Uh, I say, you know, I live with a lot, of, uh, a lot of guilt at times. I know that the Lord has completely forgiven me. Even though I don't understand it, I know that Christ has forgiven me. You know, his arms of mercy have been outstretched. But my heart goes out to those that have lost loved ones. I, I pray for them all the time. And I, I know that they probably will not forgive me and never will. And I would do anything if I can go back and change things. But uh, today, I just, I just hope and pray that they would come to know the God that I know, that they would be able to experience some of the peace and the joy and, and the healing and the forgiveness that I have experienced through my Lord Jesus, through my Savior. I pray that I would have a chance to witness to teenagers, to share my testimony to others, that I might be able to point others to Jesus Christ. And I would like to grow in the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, 
peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness. You know, I pray that people would pray for me, that, that uh, I could become a better Christian and uh, I can continue to live my life here with hope and joy in the Holy Ghost. I'm sure you're asking yourself whether dealing with Dahmer's profession of faith or Berkowitz's, can Jesus really save them? Did Jesus really die for those wicked men after they murdered all those people? In response, I would like to offer you a couple of statements made by the Lord Jesus Christ when others were concerned with the eternal destiny of those who had passed on. In Luke, the 13th chapter, we see Jesus is asked a question regarding a couple of tragedies that took place. Now, on that very occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus responded and said to them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans just because they have suffered this fate? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you think that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse offenders than all the other people who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Notice that he puts the emphasis back on the individual. This also takes place when it comes to the confession by which the believers in Jesus Christ will be built upon. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And you see the individual responsibility of each and every person to decide what they believe about Jesus is what Christ brings it ultimately back. And one of the things that he mentions right there is that the gates of Hades would not prevail against the church that he has established. But the truth is, is that if you are not one of those blood-bought believers who are trusting in Jesus, sadly enough, you're under the dominion of darkness. And it could even be the reason that you love darkness rather than the light. And sadly enough, this is something that we've seen throughout all cultures, even those who professed belief in Christ or those who professed to trust in the one true God. In fact, when we look at the first king of Israel, King Saul, we see what takes place when someone is not obedient to the calling that God has given them. Because Saul was given a wonderful kingdom. Saul was given many different things and yet, because he lacked obedience, the very Holy Spirit that came upon him to help him be the king of Israel, fleed from him when he was no longer obedient to what God had called him to be obedient to. And when that Holy Spirit fled him, spirits came upon him, evil spirits. Interestingly enough, that Holy Spirit that would leave Saul would go on to a man named David a man after God's own heart, and the very evil spirits that came and haunted Saul would be removed when the man who had the Holy Spirit upon him would come and play music for him. And while most people would think this would create a gratitude towards him, it actually started down a course of jealousy that led King Saul into trying for the rest of his life to kill King David. And not only did he have a murderous rampage that he wanted to fulfill in killing David, but he himself, when distraught without any answers, thought instead of going and truly repenting and putting his trust back in the one true God, he went and sought after mediums. He went and sought after the witch of Endor in order to conjure up a spirit for him. And this would be his undoing. This would be the very thing that would lead to his death. You see, when someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit residing in them, the truth is, is that evil spirits can come and attack them whenever they want. We need to recognize the spiritual reality that we are in, and we need to recognize what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, 
that the prince of the power of the air works through the sons of disobedience. Are you one of them? Are you a child of disobedience who is unwilling to come to the one true God? Because Satan will sift you like wheat. And maybe you think, oh, well, I'm not against Jesus. I'm apathetic towards those things. I'm not religious. I'm just agnostic, whatever you may think. Here is what Jesus, the risen King, had to say. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. You see, to not make a choice is to make a choice. And I'm only telling you this because I had to make that choice at one point too. When I recognized all of the evil in this world is not simply just molecules bouncing against each other. It's not just us dancing to our DNA. There is a real spiritual realm. We are not wrestling simply against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. There are rulers of the darkness in heavenly places, and we need to recognize that. And you see, I'm a father of four, and when my nine-year-old was five years old and Chilling Adventures of Sabrina came out, they actually sent out an email. And this email, they had pentagrams on it and invited people to come to the Black Mass or the Black Baptism of Sabrina. And this show was just terribly, openly demonic, asking people to accept Lucifer into their hearts. And one night, while after we had prayed with our children and they were in bed and my wife and I were up, I said, have you seen this? How wicked is this? I'm gonna be posting this on our Good Fight Ministries Facebook page. And after posting it, I heard a scream like I've never heard before from my son and he ran out into the living room. And while sitting there, I prayed over him, son, what happened? What's going on? And he said, dad, I, I've, I, was, I had this terrible nightmare. It was horrible. I was standing in this circle and there was a star there and they kept coming into my face, coming into my face and people were screaming all around me. And he had never seen a pentagram. He had no idea what it was at the time. And I knew that because Satan knew he wasn't going to get to my wife or myself, he knew he'd go after my children. I recognized something, that I have no power in and of myself. And I recognized without a doubt, the only power that we have is with Jesus Christ. And the only chance that you have, because Jesus is the one who said, he was not with me is against me. Jesus is the one who cried out, if there was any other way, let this cup, the wrath that he was going to take upon himself for the sins of the world, let this cup pass from me. There is no other way to be saved but by Jesus Christ and His penalty that was paid on the cross on your behalf. If you've never known Jesus Christ, or maybe you've been lying to yourself, as the Bible talks about those who deceive themselves, not being doers of the word, but merely hearers only, this is a great time for you. In Romans chapter 10, verses nine through 13, we are called to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth something. That is that Jesus Christ paid for your sins and that he rose again. And all who believe in the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you haven't done that, right now is a great time. You need to recognize that you're a sinner. You need to recognize that you have no shot against the enemy and you certainly don't have a shot against God on the day of judgment. But if you turn to Christ, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and put your trust in Him and follow Him. Have it repent. That means to have a change of heart, which leads to a change of action, leaving a life of sin, and now going forward towards Christ, then you will be saved. You put your trust in Him right now, recognize that He is your only shot, and guess what? You will go out of darkness and into light. You will not be under condemnation, but you will be in Christ and you'll begin a loving relationship with them. And I encourage you guys to find a Bible-believing church. That means people that love Jesus, read His Word and love it, and then go there, have fellowship one with another, and confess your sins to Him because He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God bless you.